time for the second keynote speech by Davide Rocchesso. I invited Davide, he has been always present in the DAFIX in the early times. He organized himself a DAFIX in Verona in the 2000. <laughs> and um, I invited him because always he has been an inspiration uh, more of, of a philosophical uh, side are aspects of uh, sound, you know, I created this concept of sounding objects and I uh, worked a lot on this interaction between sounding objects and other things. We were try to work on projects that always been uh, an inspiration for philosophical aspects, so ideas which sometimes we forget because we get very much involved in the techniques here. So this aspect is also very important to start new trends in the ratings. So today is uh, time for a new acronym, QAFEX. <laughs> Where Q, I guess, is uh, quantum, I could guess. And audio effects still, okay, great. So, uh, he is professor at the University of Palermo, but he has been in many uh, universities and many European projects. Uh, he worked first in Verona and then in Venice, uh, and who knows, maybe in the future, some other place. <laughs> Davide, come. Thank you. Come to the... Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, thanks for your kind words. Um, yes, I did organize DAFEX in the year 2000. It was the third edition, I believe. How many of you were there? Ah, oh, we are the survivors. <laughs> uh, I'm very, very glad to be back in this community. Oh, I believe it kept the promise. And what uh, I would like to uh, talk with you about uh, is uh, the eternal quest of uh, um, finding or looking for the um, fundamental elements of the sound world. So quanta is, stays for the elements, not only for quantum theory. And the Q in Quafex uh, stands for quantum, but also for quasi, because <laughs> I'm gonna uh, show you some quasi audio effects in a sense. Um, so just, just not to go back to the, to the Greeks, but we limit ourselves to the last couple of centuries, uh, the 19th century uh, was essentially driven by the mathematics that uh, Fourier introduced to describe uh, signals, uh, periodic and non-periodic signals, as sums of possibly uh, infinitely many uh, sinusoidal components. And essentially all the 19th century um, was uh, um, exploring acoustics, but also physiology in uh, Fourier terms uh, in, as uh, sinusoidal components, uh, oscillators, and uh, uh, resonators. So the, the anal uh, analysis instruments were done this way with the resonators. The uh, inner ear was described uh, as uh, uh, resonators uh, and so on. And then uh, von Helmholtz was uh, for sure uh, one of the key figures of that time, but as even if in his own writing, you can find some sentences say that uh, the fact of using sinusoidal expansions or Fourier expansions uh, is not carved in stone. There are many possible other ways to decompose sounds, but this is very convenient because the mathematics is very solid. <laughs> And actually, the, uh, in the following century, the, the uh, 20th century, there was a huge revolution in physics, as you know, and uh, uh, several key uh, persons uh, started proposing uh, um, different ways to look at sounds or uh, extensions of Fourier theory. Uh, Wiener uh, himself was saying that probably um, the Fourier uh, description is not the most useful for sound, but especially Gabor, who's considered some, sort of a, the father of uh, wavelets and granular synthesis, was introduces, introducing con concept of quantum theory into the acoustic uh, world. 
um, so defining these fundamental cells where time is as important as frequency and, there, and these two quantities are in, incompatible in a sense and so there's the uncertainty principle uh, of time frequency analysis. And this um, paved the way for the following uh, work in uh, sound, acoustics and audio and especially the short time Fourier transform introduced in the 70s uh, uh, was what made it possible to start doing uh, digital audio effects uh, properly and this is was largely this was largely due to uh, an algorithmic breakthrough that was the fast Fourier transform uh, reinvented by <coughs> Cooley and Taki. Um, so uh, right after uh, we started seeing uh, um, the composition of sounds into broad uh, subcategories of sounds, in a sense. So uh, sinusoidal modeling started first in the context of speech, but then in the context of sound in general. Uh, Serra is uh, one of the founding members of this community, who contrib contributed a lot on this. Uh, so the science plus noise model <coughs> was uh, uh, proposed uh, to allow uh, things such as this, so to extract a sinusoidal component and separate from the noise to make transformations possible. Okay, this is a very classical example by Serra. But very soon uh, people realized that uh, noise is too broad as a category, uh, and it's not adequate to represent all the uh, things that vary very rapidly in time. And in fact, the model was extended to size plus noise plus transients, and especially at Stanford with uh, um, Scott Levine, Julius Smith, uh, Tony Verma, Theresa Meng, they came up with uh, a way to separate the three components. Uh, they had the brilliant idea to uh, represent spikes in the time domain as sinusoids in the frequency domain, so it became possible to apply the sinusoidal model to the frequency domain through the DCT. And uh, uh, so they were able to separate these three parts uh, pretty well. And nowadays, uh, uh, there are several uh, implementations of this principle in different ways. Um, and uh, I think last year, there was a paper about comparing, a tool to compare the different kinds of separations. But the, the main point here is that you have this threefold uh, description of sound. So science plus noise plus transients. Uh, let's go to the art world for a second. Uh, early 20th century, uh, Italian futurists um, started looking at sounds uh, from a different perspective, different from the usual musical perspective. They were trying to bring everyday sounds into the musical domain, and they were trying to do it by uh, constructing physically physical models that were these intona rumori, these boxes that were engineered to try to reproduce processes that generate sounds in the, in the real world. But at the same time, uh, they realized that the, uh, the human voice is uh, extremely important, not only for speaking, but to communicate sound among humans. So they introduced uh, ways, or they devised way to, ways to communicate sounds through poetry and through written poetry even. So through typography, for example. Not only onomatopoeia, but also <laughs> working out a special uh, typographic character to do, to do that. So on one side you have physical models in a sense, on the other you have the human voice. Uh, another um, major figure was Pierre Schaeffer who applied a phenomenological uh, method to devise a general theory that included both uh, what he called musical object and sound object that are phenomenological entities and uh, the listening process. He was trying to uh, describe sounds through sort of a skeleton, uh, so finding a morphology of sounds. This is uh, a snapshot of a publication of is on where he introduced concepts such as the mass of sound, the caliber, and there's a couple of words that uh, will play a major role in the following of my presentation that are superposition and ambiguity. Superposition and ambiguity are uh, crucial words uh, 
both in perception and uh, in physics. Uh, at the turn of the millennium uh, in uh, human-computer interaction, there was also a big turn in uh, um, approaches to the, uh, designing interface, and there was the so-called embodied interaction uh, turn, uh, especially driven by the publication of the book by Paul Dorish, where the action is. So interfaces started to manifest themselves through direct manipulation, um, and uh, at that time, I was at the University of Verona, where I did organize the affix, uh, and uh, we um, jumped onto the wagon, especially with my um, uh, PhD student at that time, Matthias Rath, and uh, um, studied uh, objects that, through continuous manipulation mediated by sound, could um, um, achieve some, uh, uh, some goals in a task like uh, rolling a ball on a specific position. Uh, so that was embodiment through manipulation, but limiting our attention to just pure sound, what is the embodied sound world is our voice, uh, because our voice uh, can be used, and is used, it is used uh, even by small children who don't know how to speak properly, to communicate sound to, to other humans. Of course, there are virtuosi of this, of, of this thing, of vocal imitations, like this uh, Fred Newman. These are short excerpts from his book. But any of us can indeed produce a large variety of sounds. And if we take all of these excerpts that I was just playing in the background and uh, analyze them uh, uh, through feature extraction, so extraction of acoustic description, you get points in a very high dimensional space that you can project onto uh, two dimensions and cluster, and you can find uh, three groups. And what's interesting is that if you look of the um, look for the prototypes of these three groups, so the centroid of the three clusters, you get something very harmonic, like a, a trumpet imitation, or something like a, which is a train of pulses, or uh, more broadband noises. Okay, so again, we, we get these threefold partitions into sounds plus transient plus noises, in a sense. But from um, sounds produced by the human voice, to imitate everyday, everyday sounds. In the SCATVG project that um, I was coordinating um, until uh, early 2017, there was a group of uh, phoneticians at uh, KTH uh, who uh, recorded a large uh, set of vocal imitations provided both by uh, professionals of the voice and laypersons, and they annotated very accurately with phonetic uh, uh, articulatory descriptions. Um, and that's interesting because uh, if you reduce uh, all of these annotations, which are very many with the, even new words that were invented to describe the, these mechanisms, uh, they group into three main categories, which the phoneticians called vocal fold phonations, so sounds that are generated by the vocal folds, supraglottal myoelastic vibration, which is a bit exotic for us, but it's train pulses, or pulse trains, pulse trains, pulse trains, uh, trains of pulses, uh, and turbulence, which is broadband noise. And these uh, micro categories could be properly recognized by um, multi-layer perceptrons with uh, um, decent uh, accuracy. Um, and so, um, embodied sound communication is mediated by our voice. So it's person-to-person -person communication of a sonic concept. And what happens is that uh, uh, we try to reenact a sonic process that may have nothing to do with a human voice, to reenact it through a vocal process, an articulatory vocal process. So that uh, if I imitate a sound, this is my own voice, uh, uh, you, you get it, it's not a real car, but you probably immediately get it. It's, it's an imitation of something like this. 
Uh, so the processes are very different, the left and the, and the right are totally different physical processes, but they are very strongly connected perceptually. And so we exploited this uh, voice as a bridge between production and perception, or as I like to say, uh, between uh, uh, distal and proximal, um, to help sound designers so to uh, come up with tools that can be uh, used by sound designers. This is a, a picture from a paper where we, uh, we presented such a tool, uh, which is essentially a, a very simple uh, learning machine that is uh, trained with very few examples from the user who is asked to imitate like wind, water, engine, a few, really a few examples. Uh, and then uh, the user or sound designer can uh, articulate a complex vocalization and the machine will give back a set of components like a bit of wind, a bit of uh, water, a bit of engine, and you get a motor, a uh, water motor, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and when you have uh, this modeling, uh, this model you can play it back, so you have the set stage and then the play, stage, and perhaps a, a very short video can give you a more precise idea. This is Stefano delle Monache using the tool to design sounds for a car. First he's using uh, components that are physical models, pretty much like the futurists, and then he's using components that come from uh, um, a, um, ensembles of uh, uh, short sounds. So concatenative. This is physical models. And this is with a concatenative synthesis. And then is playing with these components in real time to balance them and, uh, and get the desired sound. So in the middle you have uh, this, um, again, this uh, threefold description of sounds in terms of phonation, myoelastic oscillations and turbulence, and you can either freeze these components or you can play with them, both with gestures or uh, with, sound, with, with the voice itself. Okay, that was this CADVG project. Now, uh, a big jump, because I would like to talk a bit about what I've been uh, thinking on in the most more recent, year, more recent years, uh, which is uh, a model of sound in general that is still based on uh, macro phonetic descriptors. And it is essentially an analogy, a strict analogy with uh, the spin. Uh, so it's a quantum vocal theory of sound, in a sense that I, I developed it with Maria Mannone. And here, instead of a spin, we call it the phone. Uh, it's this object uh, psi, which is a state of a Hilbert space. Um, this uh, sphere here is what the physicists call the block sphere. And it has three axes that in our domain are translated or uh, they represent on the Z component, you have a phonation with low to high pitches. On the X component, you have turbulence with dull or bright noises. And on the Y axis, you have a pulse with slower, fast pulsation. So this is our interpretation. And, uh, and now I uh, will essentially give you a crash introduction to quantum theory with the language of uh, uh, phonetics and sound. So uh, on the z-axis, we have uh, uh, pitch, and we have the so-called computational basis. This is a term from quantum computing, uh, with pitch up and pitch down, which are these two vectors here, u and d, which are eigenvectors of a pitch operator, which is this sigma z, uh, it's one of the Pauli matrices, uh, and uh, the, eigen, the eigenvalues are plus and minus one. But any phone state can be described as a um, linear combination of up and down with these alpha coefficients that are complex numbers. And these are called probability amplitudes. They are not strictly probability, 
but the, there's, when they are square, they become probabilities, so there's a, a normalization condition, and they are uh, obtained as projection of uh, uh, the phone onto uh, the um, basis vectors. Uh, on the other uh, um, axis, the x-axis, uh, we have uh, <coughs> noises or uh, turbulence with the um, vectors that are called R and L uh, that are eigenvectors of this uh, uh, turbulence operator, which is called in quantum computing the NOT gate. Uh, and there is a um, matrix that allows to change the basis from pitch to turbulence. And this is the Adamard gate, which is uh, uh, basically present in every quantum computing uh, algorithm or circuit. And the other axis is the y-axis, where the um, basis vectors are complex, and they are uh, eigenvectors of this sigma y operator. And again, there's a, a change of basis that is made possible through this matrix. Um, so there are a couple of concepts that are uh, essential in, in quantum theory. One is preparation. A, a state can be prepared. Um, for example, the perfectly uh, turbulent state can be uh, described as a perfect um, summation, for a second, or superposition indeed, of up and down with equal coefficient. And uh, uh, if, if we have such a state, and we set a measurement apparatus to measure pitch, there will be equal probabilities to get pitch up or pitch down because the two coefficients are the same. And the measurement operators are these uh, outer vector, outer, outer product uh, matrices. In general, uh, a phon will be a linear combination with some coefficients alpha. Uh, um, each of them one squared is a probability, so the sum of the squares must be one. And uh, uh, the result of a measurement will be up or down depending on the coefficients. But the expectation value is given by this, uh, is uh, mediated by this uh, sigma z operator. And in the case of perfect uh, turbulence, uh, it will be zero, the expectation value. None of the measurement will be zero, but on average it will be zero. And the, the other important concept is, indeed, measurement. So uh, measurement is uh, something that determines the new state. So there's a, the so-called collapse after measurement. Everything in quantum mechanics is, uh, um, is linear and reversible until you measure. Uh, there's a, a principle that is called the spin polarization principle that we call, can call the, the phone polarization principle, saying that there is no sound state, in our case, for which the expectation of the three components is simultaneously zero. This is something that I, I, I like to call the John Cage principle, because it stated that very clearly. <laughs> there is no such thing as silence. Um, you may ask uh, yourself, how uh, can you uh, extract a phonation, phonation or something uh, periodic and sinusoidal even out of noise? Well, it's something that we do uh, every day on a regular basis with perception. And there are, um, there's the, the, the large literature of auditory scene analysis that have many examples that can be helpful. Uh, in that sense, and especially there's one effect that was discovered by Giovanni Bruno Vicario in 1960 and then rediscovered by several other persons, and especially Al Bregman uh, studied it very thoroughly, which was called the tunnel effect originally. Uh, it means that if you have glides with holes, The interruptions due to holes are very, very audible, but if you put noise, the signs are continuous. So you essentially hear the sine wave through the noise, even though it's not there. This is another realization with a different location of the uh, noise bursts. 
But again, so uh, through our perception, we do extract uh, signs out of noise. Uh, this is uh, uh, very nicely uh, described within the framework of constructivism in uh, psychology, and we can say that measurements create phenomena. And uh, indeed, uh, it's a nice, uh, um, um, nice, um, how can I say, uh, connection between uh, uh, psychology and physics that I will come back later as well. But still, to remain on the, in auditory scene analysis, there are many uh, examples, for example, in the website of uh, Al Bregman with all the, these uh, examples from his book, um, that uh, justify, at least for me, the, the choice of the three axes of the block sphere. Uh, the the z-axis, you have uh, uh, high and low pitches, and this is the domain where uh, the streaming occurs and uh, segregation manifests. So by changing the timing and the distance between the notes, you start from hearing this to hearing this. <clears throat> Similarly, there are other streaming effects on the x-axis where there's turbulence or noises with different noises of different uh, bands, such as in this case. Okay, this is to give a sort of perceptual justification to, to the model and uh, also to make it clear that is, uh, the model has to do with sound generation but a lot also with sound perception. And another key concept in quantum theory is uh, uh, commutation, if it occurs or not. Or not. Uh, measurement uh, along two different axes uh, do not commute. And uh, it is a fact in um, uh, spectrotemporal analysis as well. Uh, for instance, if you take the signs plus noise model, which, is, uh, uh, which stays on the ZX plane, uh, you get two very different things if you apply uh, the measurement of pitch or signs uh, before the measurements of uh, turbulence or noise. Um, if you, if you switch the order, you get totally different spectra. It means that the two operators, M sub uh, R for noise and M sub U, sub U for pitch, they don't commute, their commutator is not zero. Uh, this is a concept of complementarity or incompatibility in physics, which interestingly enough was introduced in psychology by William James uh, in the late uh, 19th century. And what I, I uh, read only recently is that uh, um, uh, Niels Bohr, uh, in giving his interpretation of quantum mechanics, was inspired by that work that is about 25 years uh, before the interpretation of quantum theory. Uh, so in, the, in this sense, psychology uh, came before physics. Um, a key concept that I mentioned already is that of superposition, an example of acoustic superposition in the uh, set of uh, vocal sounds on the ZY plane, that is the pitch uh, pulsation plane, may be this. Okay, uh, the, the red lines are the extraction of the most salient pitch and of uh, onsets that, uh, an onset detector is used to um, detect the most significant transients. So you have this pulse strain. Uh, so how do the state uh, in this Hilbert space evolve? In physics, uh, there's uh, the Schrodinger equation, which has this form, uh, and uh, whose central element is this H, the um, Hamiltonian. 
which in general is time varying, um, but from given two points in time, the transformation of the state of the phone, in our case from time zero to time t in general, is always unitary. And uh, if uh, H is time independent, there's a very simple solution for the uh, unitary transformation. It's just an exponential, uh, complex exponential matrix. Um, if the Hamiltonians at time zero and t commute, uh, you can still find an expression of it, for it, of the, of the evolution as a, a, an exponential with an integral. An important point is that during evolution, the system remains in superposition of states until a measurement occurs, and the outcome of measurement is probabilistic, because it's driven by the probability amplitudes. Uh, the state uh, changes under the effect of external forces that determine the change of probabilities. Um, how can we apply this concept of evolution in the world of sound and in the world of the phone in particular? Uh, continuing with the analogy with the spin, we can imagine the phone to be subject to a magnetic field. And if the magnetic field is uh, st static, um, it's just the angle between the spin and the, and the magnetic field that determines the, the evolution. And it does it through the Hamiltonian that is uh, constant in this case, and as this form, it's the sum of Pauli matrices or quaternions, as uh, um, Miller Packet would like to uh, call them. So this is the case of static magnetic field. And what can we do? Uh, I thought that uh, we can consider um, neighborhoods of a certain time instant and consider the um, situation to be kind of static in that neighborhood. Uh, similarly to what happens in, uh, in, in phonetics and in speech with the concept of coarticulation, where it's neighboring sounds that determine how the, the local and finer grain uh, sounds evolve. So this is what I try to do uh, in attempt to model this evolution. And uh, I started from a simple example, again, from uh, uh, auditory scene analysis and streaming. Uh, this simple example is simple but very interesting perceptually. You have two crossing glides uh, with a burst of noise in the middle, and uh, experiments have been for performed on this, and when people are asked, what did you hear, some of them will uh, describe a, a glide going through another glide, and some other will uh, describe a bounce. So the sound is something like this. And uh, if we apply evolution of a phone state from pitch up, which are these green dots, um, in this specific realization of the evolution, where we take measurements at regular, uh, but not so, um, uh, not so often, at regular times, but not so often, um, we get this evolution, which is one of the infinitely many possible evolutions. And, uh, uh, but what is, uh, I can resynthesize this evolution as a sort of a skeleton of the example. So, uh, with the sine wave when there's a well defined pitch, and with the burst of noise when the pitch is not defined, like down here, and we get something like this. So, in this specific realization, there's a definitely there's a definite direction downward, and there is this burst of noise that is uh, displaced from the place where it actually occurs, and this is also something you uh, find in perceptual experiments, that it's called the temporal dislocation effect, that uh, people are not able to locate the point of the burst precisely in time, when there are changes in pitch. <clears throat> And we can take this evolution and uh, represent it uh, as uh, three segments, like the first glide and take a measurement here, the uh, noise burst and take a measurement there, and the rest of the glide, and represent it with the tools of quantum computing as a circuit, as a quantum circuit of one bit, where you have three unitary transformations, <clears throat> yes, and the three measurement points, and you measure, uh, you get a classical bit, 
uh, at each of these three points, and you can run the circuit thousands of times and collect statistics out of it, and you get something like this, uh, where it is clear for this specific case that uh, uh, 0, 0, 0 is the most probable measurement. It means a pitch up at each of the three points. There are some other possibilities, and uh, there are other possi there are eight possible uh, outcomes here, but essentially only four mani manifest uh, themselves. Um, yet another concept from uh, uh, quantum theory is that of mixing, which is also very familiar in audio. Uh, um, but mixing in quantum theory is essentially um, putting the, the observer in a position of uh, uh, epistemic uncertainty. So we don't know exactly what the source are, are, uh, sources are. We have only probabilistic knowledge about that. And uh, the ensemble is inseparable to the ears of the listener, I would say, in acoustic terms. In this case, uh, the we don't have the state, we have the density operator, which is indeed obtained from many possible states through uh, coefficients that are indeed probabilities. So they have to sum up to one. And time evolution is still unitary of the density matrix. When you take a measurement, you take the trace of this density matrix times the measurement operator, and you have a collapse that forces the density matrix to take a new form after the measurement. So, uh, if we want to take this, um, uh, the, the, this uh, attitude in uh, considering sound evolutions of uh, mixing states, um, it, it's nice to come up with a way to sonify the evolution process. Um, there are many possi possibilities. Uh, one possibility is, for example, to um, consider uh, the pitch up and pitch down probabilities if you have a mixture of up and down and take the minimum, uh, say this is a noise floor and, and uh, you produce signs proportional to the difference between the maximum and the minimum. This is exactly what you do uh, with the conversion from RGB colors to HSV when you determine saturation as a, a difference, a normalized difference between maximum and minimum. Uh, so saturation is departure from white or, or gray axis, like uh, pitchiness is departure from white noise. So this is the, the trick I use to sonify the um, evolution of mixed states. And if I apply, I apply this uh, to the example of the crossing lights, uh, one possible um, evolution and its rendering, if I restrict myself to the ZX plane, so size plus noise, I get something like this. And where uh, it's, interesting, it's interesting that at a certain point uh, uh, we switch from uh, upward glide to the downward glide as if my attention was switching from one to the other. So the listening process is somehow described inside the synthesis. And uh, for the superposition example, uh, here I consider also the y-axis, so pulse trains as well, and uh, uh, I may get this kind of evolution. Play it again because it's short. So this is what I would call a quasi-audio effect or <laughs> quantum audio effect, if you prefer. Uh, to go to something more um, elaborate, uh, consider this uh, uh, recording made with overlays by Maria Mannone.
So if I extract the, the two most salient pitches, if I extract noise energy in two different bands and extract onsets as well, these are the three components, I can resynthesize a sort of a skeleton of the performance with all imperfections of uh, pitch, de uh, yes, pitch detection and everything. Uh, there's no transform quantum transformation here. But this is just a skeleton. So now uh, let's apply a quantum evolution uh, with a Hamiltonian that is uh, uh, composed as two parts, one static part S, which is given by the local neighborhood of sounds, taken on 20 frames, sort of co-articulation, and a sort of a damping uh, factor, which is time dependent. And you have the three components of the uh, Hamiltonian, what the coefficients that were called n sub x, n sub y, and n sub z in the previous uh, matrix I showed. And with this, you can have the evolution. So I showed you how the, the phone moves on the block sphere together with sound. These are the three components uh, written down. And essentially what I did was uh, consider the two angles phi and theta. Uh, the state or the phone can be converted into these two angles as uh, miller Packet was showing yesterday for quaternions. And uh, I take... Uh, decisions based on these angles. For example, if theta is uh, within a certain interval, I produce a, a certain pitch. If it is uh, in another interval, I produce another pitch. Uh, this was free because there's no measurement in this evolution. I do this in a, uh, without measurement in quantum physics, you can never know what's happening inside. But in simulation, you know everything because you do the simulation. So you can have this representation of the free evolution. If I do introduce uh, a sparse measurements, such as one every 100 frames, I get a much more noisy and chaotic evolution because of collapses, which are dramatic events. Of course, when you take a measurement, you, uh, you have to decide how to orient your measurement apparatus. So what I did here was uh, to peep the state right before measurement, another thing that you cannot do physically. And if the state was close enough, for example, to pitch up, I would uh, take a pitch measurement. Um, what if uh, uh, I consider the state to be mixed? So what is the evolution from a mixed state? In this case, I consider initially a density matrix that is one third pitch up and two thirds uh, pitch down with this form. And if I do the same kind of evolution, this time with a measurement every 20 frames, I get something nicer to my ears. which is uh, represented by this. This is the spectrogram of the result, and this is the evolution of the three components, pitch, noise, and pulse. 
in time. Uh, yet another example, more musical one, but still very, refer uh, very relevant uh, for uh, streaming, because there are definitely two melodic lines here. And uh, uh, pitch uh, following, the, the two most salient pitches are outlined here into different colors, and the pitch salience is this uh, second graph, and the noise energy is down here. So the, you, you all know this. Uh, what if I make the phone evolve, for example, from pitch up? Uh, one possible evolution, taking one measurement every five frame with pitch and a threshold of 0 0.9, is this. If I run it again, I will have another uh, evolution and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that at a certain point, there's a jump from, the, uh, fr from one melodic line to the other. And, uh, and the attention stays on one of the two lines for a certain time. So some, somehow this transformation mimics the process of listening. At least this is my hope. Uh, ah, yeah. All you have seen so far, it's about one phone or one qubit in quantum computing. Uh, quantum computers with one qubit are not interesting at all. Uh, the whole business of quantum computing is uh, about getting as many quantum bits uh, or qubits as possible and as stable as possible. Uh, the question is, what happens if you have more than one qubit in this uh, theoretical framework? Oof, I don't know. But there, there, you can do many different things. This is one possibility. Um, when you have more than one qubit, uh, you get into entangles. And all quantum computing algorithms are about entangling qubits. Uh, so what may it mean for music and audio to entangle phones? Um, well, there's a word that has a specific meaning in, uh, in uh, audio and music, which is entrainment, that has a lot to do with rhythm. Uh, what about entanglement? This is a possible scenario that I depicted just for fun. Imagine uh, we have uh, three categories of people. One is the composer, who essentially tells the performance uh, what to play. So it gives instructions to the performers. And uh, uh, play means measure. Then you have the conductor, that is called uh, Charlie, who prepares and sends phones to the performers. And the performers are, of course, called Alice and Bob. And their uh, role is uh, to read the score or the instructions of the composer and to measure or play the phones that are sent by the conductor. So can we reduce this scenario to a quantum circuit? Yes, on this side you have uh, uh, the conductor who prepares the two qubits or the two phones uh, with some entanglement. Uh, when you have these C naught uh, gates in quantum computing, you are entangling the qubits. And on the other side, you may have Alice and Bob, Alice on the top row and Bob on the bottom row. Alice performing, in this case, a uh, phonation measurement, measurement along the uh, Z axis, and Bob performing uh, turbulence measurements uh, along the X axis. You run it many times and you get statistics and you see that not all possible outcomes are actually realized. Only three out of four possible outcomes and one is much more likely. Uh, if we change the instruction and say Alice performs turbulence measurement as well as Bob, you get all four possible outcomes and one is much more likely. So you could play with this and introduce this probabilistic component with an entanglement between the objects that are in the hands of the uh, performers. Um, just to conclude with a reference to uh, the old days, in 95 I published a paper on a Computer Music Journal uh, proposing a model that was called the ball within the box, uh, which was essentially an interpretation of a feedback delay network as a, a box, so a room, with a, scattering, a single scattering object, a ball, 
and uh, each delay line was associated with a stand, a plan, a standing wave uh, going back and forth along a specific direction. So uh, you have a discretization of directions and uh, as many as the number of the, uh, feedback delay lines. Uh, several people uh, studied many different uh, matrices for the feedback delay networks. We have some experts here. Where is Sebastian? <laughs> for example, um, unitary matrices have definitely been explored, but not only those. There are other possibilities for structures that preserve stability. But within quantum computing, you only can use uh, unitary transformations. So my question, but it's really for future, <clears throat> uh, can we imagine about a quantum uh, reverberation or a, a reverberation of qubits? In this case, uh, a four by four matrix may be used for two qubits only. Uh, this is a, an interesting structure because it's uh, an householder reflection, it is circulant, it, had, it has other math properties, uh, and it can be implemented on a, on a quantum circuit in this way, uh, where you see this C0 gate, which makes the qubit entangled. So entanglement is uh, the, the quantum version of scattering, in a sense. Uh, I have a few more slides, but I don't show them. I just conclude with uh, a few references of this second half of my presentation, if you're interested. Thank you. There is time for questions. Over there. Georg. Uh, hi, Davide. Thank you for this talk. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, so, yeah, in, so the quantum model is unitary, as you said, and I've, I've been wondering uh, what your thoughts are on stuff like loudness. We'll be looking for scaling in some ranges that don't really fit the unitary model. Is it like just multiple measurements colla uh, collapsing at the same time and that scales it? Or what do you think would be sort of a loudness model in your, in your picture? It's, uh, it's an extreme simplification of the auditory world, what, what I'm proposing and using here indeed. And this, uh, well, the good side of it is that it leaves a whole uh, universe open. Uh, I, I reduced my attention, for instance, to just uh, two levels of pitch, up or down, and then in the examples I'm reusing the pitches that I'm extracting from the analysis. But actually, uh, we could think ab about extending this to many uh, levels, uh, so many qubits for pitches, uh, uh, there's theoretically no limitation for that. Um, also, loudness uh, um, has been used in the uh, examples because uh, uh, think about the energy of noise is actually dri driving the evolution of the Hamiltonian, so determining uh, certain collapses. Um, but th there's uh, a large uh, degree of uh, arbitrary decisions in, the, in uh, sonifying these processes. I would say, which makes it uh, perhaps uh, fascinating from the effects point of view. Thanks. I, if, I don't know. I want to dominate. I have one other sort of comment, which I, 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 I like this very much, right? Because we have this phenomena in perception that we have this flipping of states, right? Do we group them, these, these pulses, to be co located in one pitch area, or do we see the, hear the jumps? Um, and it seems like you have a model where you, you just can place the origin of these effects, right? Because, for example, for um, you know, uh, beating two separate pitch perception, that's at somewhere between 10 and 20 hertz, and it turns out a lot of our perceptual phenomena have sort of the same zero. And, and maybe this is actually a way where we can get at understanding why multiple perceptive phenomena seem to have shared um, collapses into different regions. All right, it's very, very nice work, thank you so much. What it, would, what it would be nice to do is to start from experiments, collecting statistics from experiments, like for, for the crossing lights, for example, and reconstruct circuits that reproduce the same distribution, for example, uh, just to give some solid ground <laughs> based on experiments.
Thanks for the fascinating uh, work. Uh, I really like the connection uh, to quantum theory because especially sound can be seen as a particle and as a wave. Uh, but I don't think I understood the link to the other properties, uh, which is discretization and uncertainty principle. Which variables are discretized in your model and where is the link of a combination of two variables which underlies some kind of un uh, uncertainty when, when measuring? Yes, Gabor was discussing uncertainty uh, with the terms of uh, quantum operators uh, in uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. This is not something I applied in my quantum vocal theory. Um, um, yes, and it, it's not something you find uh, in the description of the spin, for example. Um, yeah, it was there because it's also important <laughs> what he did, also for the connection with the quantum theoretical world. But uh, it's not something I really used. May I just another comment uh, that uh, the illusions you have you have presented, uh, very nice. Uh, there is a concept of causal inference where uh, from the uh, from neuroscience. Uh, a concept which describes how we as um, human perceive the world, and many bistable illusions can be explained by that. Uh, so maybe link with your theory with causal inference can help to far to develop that. That was in one of the slides I was skipping. Uh, <laughs> dressed up to go where. Uh, th there are many possible con connections for future work. One is these, there are very famous examples of uh, ambiguous stimuli, both visual and auditory, such as this, for example. Yeah. Uh, some, some people hear Laurel, some others hear Yeni, somehow. <laughs> That's difficult to explain because every person uh, hears one of the two very clearly. So it's not ambiguous for the person, it's ambiguous for the, uh, the collective, right? And the same for the dress. Um, what, uh, that's in another slide, recently uh, I read this uh, study, which I found really cool, uh, about a, a stimulus which is inherently ambiguous, which is an interval of shepherd tones uh, that can be heard as upward or downward. Uh, every person here is only one of the two. And if you take an ensemble of person, they are almost perfectly balanced. So it's inherently ambiguous, but our perception somehow is deterministic. But what they found is that they measured the, the pupil, the dilation of the eye, and when the stimulus is so ambiguous, the eyes do something like this, they open up. So it means that internally there is some ambiguous representation that doesn't come to, to the response or to consci conscience. <laughs> Uh, response. That's uh, fascinating because uh, it has to do with uh, how things are represented internally and, uh, and there are uh, theories about the representations as uh, superposition of several things simultaneously that collapse only at the moment of uh, measurement in a sense, so perceiving, giving out the percept. So uh, let me start with a very formal question. Uh, so your space of states is three-dimensional. You chose to represent it with two-dimensional vectors. Why, why, uh, why did you do that? Uh, so one is complex, I've seen, but... Uh... Yeah, that, that's a really the, the cool thing. Uh, because, ah, can I go, can I go back? Oops. Uh, this has to do with the fact that the coefficients are complex, so they have four numbers, right. but there's one normalization condition, so the space is three-dimensional. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, also because you mentioned GABA theory, and uh, as far as understood, uh, the unitarity is some restrictions for you for this process, right? Uh, would it help if uh, you consider your states not to be uh, orthogonal, but uh, to be non-orthogonal, to be redundant. 
because then you could go beyond perhaps, unitarity. Okay. Perhaps. Uh, I was just uh, following a trend in perception and cognition of describing things with uh, quantum-based or quantum-inspired models. So I tried to, kept, uh, to keep as many of the constraints as possible, uh, but nothing prevents to, to get rid of some of them. Yeah, but there's also some work on quantum theory which, where you uh, get away from this orthogonality. So. Oh, yes, that's something I don't know okay. <laughs> as a non-physicist, so yeah. this is the basic. So. Okay. Ciao, Davide. So, uh, uh, is, the, is this model, uh, I mean, linked only to, the, to, to humans, or are you thinking also of uh, other living species? No, no, so some, some sounds resemble um, maybe bird songs. Uh, so mm. so if, as, as, as any universal model, then it might be applicable to uh, other living species. So there might be perceptual experiments uh, existing, maybe uh, made by somebody on, on birds or um, monkeys or, or, or where, where you I'm, can I'm... find some, some counterparts, some... some uh, I'm pretty being... sure that the, the, the streaming phenomena occurs to animals as well, even though it's more difficult to ask uh, what they heard, because it, they're based on phenomenology or asking people <laughs> to describe what they heard, essentially. But, but, uh, but there are the ethologists who do experiment with food, typically, <laughs> to ask animals what they heard. Uh, but... Uh, cannot give a general answer, but uh, I'm pretty, pretty sure that these things extend. 